Hi everyone, thank you for clicking on my talk. Uh, the title of my presentation today is The Current Revolution of Women-Directed Reprevention Narratives. So of course, as a content warning, uh, I'll be talking about some triggering subjects, so you know, if, feel free to just pause or leave my talk to another moment if you feel like. Um, also, I'll be giving some spoilers to a number of films, and for that I can only apologize. So, um, even though the rape revenge films have been uh, prominent since the 1970s, what is essential to the talk here is the research of rape revenge films directed by women in the latter part of the 2010s. That's not to say that rape revenge films directed by women did not exist before, but the reason for this is twofold. First is that throughout my PhD, I propose that we can currently observe a shift in the paradigm of female representation in horror films, mainly due to the increase of women filmmakers, and thus by focusing on contemporary films, the talk aligns itself with this idea. Second, and most importantly, is to showcase the amount of similarities that films that have been made in the last decade have, and therefore to explore what they mean in the broad context of female-directed horror films. So before we start, there are a few inconsistencies in how rape revenge narratives ha have been read. For example, Susan Brown Miller writes that to simply learn the word rape is to take instructions in the power relationships between male and females, and Ling Higgins and Brenda Silver's support the rape and rapeability are central to the very construction of gender identity. Building on this, Jacinda Reed argues that the problem at the core of rape revenge films is the quintessential feminist issue, and moreover, Sarah Projansky writes that these narratives can be understood as feminist narratives, as it sees women taking matters into their own hands and asserting revenge on their terms. Nevertheless, rape revenge narratives have been used by male directors as a trope or plot device for their, for their potential to propel narrative. For example, Sabine Silk's rhetoric of rape and Projansky rape metaphors are similar in the sense that both scholars write that these films make frequent use of sexual violence as a narrative device to talk about broader issues while simultaneously neglecting the particular experiences of women and some men who actually experience rape. For instance, a well-known reading of The Last House on the Left suggests that the issues pertaining to the film are not about rape itself but the ramifications of the Vietnam War. Conversely, what can be seen in contemporary uh, female-directed and women-centered rape revenge narratives is that rape is being used to talk about sexual assault and rape culture. Not just in rape revenge films, but in society, rape is now being used literally to bring to the fore uh, issues surrounding sexual assault, as it can be seen in documentaries such as The Hunting Ground and Audrey and Daisy and also in songs by pop artists, for example, Rihanna's Man Down, Lady Gaga's Bad Romance, Until It Happens to You. And all of this is parallel to the current research of interest in feminism with the 2017's Women's March and the explosion of the Me Too movement in 2017. So looking at female-directed rape revenge films through the post Me Too lens proves to be extremely important as it becomes clear that recent films mainly those released after 2017, are seeing women, both characters and filmmakers, reclaiming their bodies and addressing the quintessential feminist problem on their own terms and also shining a light on social problems. So this talk here is going to explore how these changes happen by first delving into the construction of the rapist and the rape, and then by looking at the construction of the avenger and the revenge. So Carol Clover writes at length about the film I Spit on a Grave, and she puts forward two key tropes of rape revenge films. First is that the rapists, rapists are uneducated and degenerate locals, and the second one is the city and country axis, which places horror outside of social law. Clover writes that the point is that rural Connecticut, or whatever, like the deep forests of Central Europe, is a place where the rules of civilization do not obtain. People from the city are people like us. People from the country are people not like us. 
So as it will be shown, this is extremely problematic as it helps to solidify dangerous assumptions regarding rape. Clover's claims, however, are certainly true for many male-directed rape revenge films. In the film The Virgin Spring, Karen is raped by three herdsmen. In The Last House on the Left, Mary and Phyllis are humiliated, raped and killed by a group of criminals. In Straw Dogs, um, Emmy is raped by a group of workmen. In Savage Streets, Heather is brutally raped by a gang of hoodlums. And as explained by Clover, in Ice Pit on a Grave, Jennifer is raped by men from the countryside that resent her from coming from New York. One of them actually says, you come from an evil place, thus making a clear distinction between city and country. So by portraying nearly every rapist as sexually repulsive, the male directed films that I've just cited um, solidify dangerous stereotypes that support the idea that rape is not present in society. So in contrast, uh, in contrast, the rapists in female-directed films, for example, American Mary, are usually university professors, they dress well, they speak in perfect grammar, so they challenge Clover's idea that the rapist is uh, an other, an uneducated or degenerate uh, local. So the, this opposition to the established trope can be seen in other female-directed films, for example, in Revenge, where Jen is raped by one of her boyfriend's friends, and her boyfriend and the rapist are portrayed as wealthy, well-dressed, and even as family men. So what happens in Revenge is that one night, uh, Jennifer, Richard, her boyfriend, and two of his friends, Stan and Dimitri, they have dinner by the swimming pool, and then Jen starts dancing with Stan and she's quite flirtatious. And then the following morning, when Richard, the boyfriend, is away, Stan confronts Jen by insinuating that it is his right to, to have sex with her, given the previous night's dance. So what is apparent here is male entitlement over a woman's body. And we can see, the sim we can see a similar dynamic in the film Violation. So what happens in this film is Miriam, uh, the protagonist is visiting her sister Greta and her brother-in-law Dylan at their isolated house. So through dialogue we can understand that they've been friends since childhood and in one scene Miriam and Dylan go hunting together, you know, they have fun by themselves and then one night they start flirting by a campfire and they share a drunken kiss. Miriam immediately ends uh, the kiss, she apologizes and acknowledges it was a mistake. Um, but then, when Dylan rapes Miriam, she's asleep and she's unable to consent, thus again reinforcing this issue of male entitlement, similar to how it's portrayed in Revenge. And this is further thwarting the trope that the rape uh, happens far away and at the hands of outsiders. So, of course, the, the issue of male entitlement is not necessarily new to rape revenge narratives. In I Spit on a Grave, Jen Johnny tells Jennifer that she asked for it when she showed her bare legs to him at the gas station, and he did what any other man would have done. However, what we can see in revenge and violation, for example, differs by showing it in a more nuanced way. While Jennifer simply waits for Johnny to put uh, petrol on her car, both Jen and Miriam flirt and they initiate something. Jen by dancing with Stan and Miriam by kissing Dylan. I Spit on a Grave shows male entitlement as something that does not belong in society. The provocation is clearly in, uh, only in Johnny's mind, but then revenge and violation complicated by depicting it as a messy territory, much as how it is currently portrayed in the news. So the films are actively playing with the contemporary discourse around rape and consent. The women play, the women flirt, but they also change their minds and say no. In Violation, for example, this is even better exemplified. So when we, Miriam wakes up to find Dylan on top of her, she says, don't, stop, which she interprets as don't stop. 
So again, this is a direct link to a he said, she said discourse that pervades rape culture. So another way that these films are challenging Clover's claims is that in films such as MFA, Black Christmas, Revenge Ride, Promising Young Woman, and American Mary, rape takes place within American universities. By doing so, the films are engaging in conversation with the current epidemic of date rape in American universities, which states that 26% of female undergraduate students experience rape or sexual assault through physical force, violence, or incapacitation. Another interesting aspect that the films show is the lack of support that the victims find at the hand of the university deans. For example, MFA sees Noel reporting her rape to the university dean, only to learn that many other victims had already reported the rape and nothing had come to it. And Promising Young Woman sees Cassie confront Dean Elizabeth Walker, who claims that she cannot possibly take into consideration every, ch every charge that comes to her making it clear that many go unnoticed. So what is more, these films also depict the rapist as a good guy, or as a fraternity brother whose future is protected by the fraternity brothers or by the university. In MFA, for example, Noel's rapist, Luke, belongs to a fraternity, and so do the other rapists that she later avenges, sorry, that she later punishes, and in Promising promising young woman, all Monroe is the promising young man whose future must be protected by the dean from the accusations against him. In depicting these narratives, these films are dramatizing well-known real-life rape cases, namely the people of the state of California versus Brock Allen Turner in 2015, where the rape was caught in the act by two eyewitnesses, it was proven by DNA, Turner was indicted on five different charges and found guilty on three felonies, even though he was only given a six-month sentence and was released on good behavior only after three months. Turner was a student athlete at Stanford University, and the rape took place within campus. Stories such as this one are not isolated, and what the films are doing is that they're taking these stories, they're stripping them of any doubt regarding blame, consent, and rape consent and rape. They're holding the system accountable and they're putting the power on the woman's hands. So the films are showing the victims say no, they show the force the men use against them, and they show how women are unable to fight back due to the fact that they've been drugged, they've been roofied, or they, they, they have been giving too much alcohol. The films also depict the universities as corrupt systems that privilege men. <clears throat> So Claire Henry argues that the focus on rape culture is actually better addressed when films examine collective trauma and collective response. This can be seen in the film The Ladies Club, for example, in which a group of women create a support group that turns to vigilantism. In the group, each woman knows someone who has been sexually assaulted or has herself been raped, which opens up to the discussion to more than just one rapist. Films like MFA, Black Christmas, Revenge Ride, and Promising Woman all address systematic misogyny, rape culture, and the idea of the rapist as a good guy or as a sports, stars, sports star or fraternity brother. MFA and Revenge Ride, for example, portray support groups for survivors who speak about rape, they have suffered, or the rape of someone that they know, uh, and they speak with such candor that makes it clear that these women have come to accept the reality of living with the imminent threat of male abuse. In Promising Young Woman, for example, Cassie goes out every night to bars and then she pretends to be drunk so she can fall prey to good guys who plan on abusing her in the guise of being helpful. Cassie goes home with those good guys and when they ignore her no's and don'ts, she reveals to be sober and scare them. These characters are played by actors who personify the idea of a good guy. Aidan Brody plays uh, Seth Cohen in the teen drama The O.C. Comedy actor Sam Richardson is best known for his role as Richard in, in HBO's Veep. Christopher Mintz Plasse is known for his role as Fogo or McLovin in Superbad. Max, Green Max Greenfield is known for playing Schmidt in New Girl, 
Cass's boyfriend Ryan is played by comedian Bo Burnham, and All Morrow, Nina's rapists, Nina's rapist is played by Chris Lowell, who is best known for his role as Piss in Veron Kamars. Not only that, the film also holds accountable one of Nina's female friends, Madison, played by Alison Brie, accountable for not believing Nina's claims, as well as Dean Walker, played by Connie Britton. Brie being famous for her role as Annie in the sitcom community, and Britton for her role as Tammy in Friday Night Lights. So the film then plays with this extra diegetic knowledge of these actors, and it plays with our assumptions by narratively making all of the characters equally responsible for Nina's rape and suicide. Now let's look at the rape itself. So the portrayal of rape represents one of the biggest challenges for rape revenge films, as there are many points to consider. To show or not to show rape, how much to show, and through whose point of view. Claire Henry claims that conveying the horror of rape is crucial in rape revenge films because it motivates and attempts to justify the protagonist's brutal acts of revenge. She continues by saying that the failure to either induce or convey the horror of rape is both a generic and feminist political failure. In this passage, Henry uses the word induce and convey, and not the word show, which opens up the discussion to the many possible ways to convey the horror of rape while withholding its exploitative nature. However, Sarah Projansky finds a paradox when she's analyzing the film The Accused. She writes that showing rape is important as it challenges the myth of rape. However, by showing the act, the film also contributes to the existence of violence against women in media culture. Finally, she claims that even a progressive text through its explicit rape scene can participate in anti-feminist discourse. Having said that, it is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to find a consensus among theorists, viewers and filmmakers regarding the representation of sexual violence, but two aspects seem to be agreeable. Uh, first is that rape revenge films must emphasize trauma, and the second one, they have to do so without eroticizing it. I Spit on a Grave is a good example here. So the assault scenes are extremely long, they're framed in wide shots, and they show the naked and the violated female body in its entirety. Barbara Creed writes about the scene in this, the rape scenes in *I Spit on a Grave*, and I'll quote here. Um, I'll quote Creed in her entirety as she touches on many important points. So she writes, "The rape scenes are filmed in such a way that women, sorry, the rape scenes are filmed in such a way that a woman becomes a complete and total victim." She's hunted down, degraded, humiliated, and tortured. The men subject her to vaginal, anal, and oral rape, and rape with the penis and with the beer bottle. She's beaten, kicked, and punched. Her creative work is even derided and desecrated. Furthermore, her humiliation and subjection are dwelt on and drawn out. On two occasions, the gang release her only to capture her again. On each occasion, their attacks grow more violent. Rarely are the rape fantasies of even hardcore pornography represented in such brutal, horrific manner. So many of the male directed films that I've cited thus far portray rape in similar uh, in a similar manner. In all of those films, the victims are naked, they're vulnerable, and the rapists show an extreme level of sadistic enjoyment. The female-directed rape revenge films analyzed here portray rape and sexual assault in a very different way. The first clear difference is the length of the scenes. They're usually shorter and they do not show the act from beginning to end, or they do so in flashbacks. So by being shorter, the scenes withhold gratuitous displays while emphasizing trauma. And when it comes to flashbacks, there are two main issues to consider. The first one is through whose eyes rape is being shown, and whereas the film The Accused and The Virgin Spring privileged the witness's point of view instead of the women who actually experienced rape, thus they're negating even further their experience, films like The Ladies Club, Dorothy Mills, Dark Touch, Culture Shock, Revenge Ride, Black Christmas, and Violation, they all privilege the victim's memories. So by offering the victim's backstory and making her the one whose experience structures the action from beginning to end, 
the film draws into her perspective. By the same token, this film's focus on the issue of post-rape trauma as her diagetic time is not directly after rape. In the case of Black Christmas, for example, Riley's flashbacks continue to haunt her after years. And the second important aspect to consider um, that emerges with shorter assault scenes is that the flashbacks um, shows the rape as uh, sometimes fractured. So unlike the film Irreversible, where rape is seen after the revenge, revenge takes place as the film is told backwards, in a long objective shot, where the film privileges the boyfriend's experiences when he hears about the rape. In the film Violation, for example, when Miriam remembers her rape, the film makes use of tight close-ups that create a feeling of confusion, detachment, alienation, and claustrophobia. And then finally, the issue of nudity is also updated in female-directed rape revenge films. While when I spit on a grave in Savage Streets, the victims are completely naked, which also helps to augment her vulnerability, contemporary rape revenge films directed by women either keep their women clothed and or keep their men naked. In the film Revenge, for example, just before Jen is raped, Stan walks in on her naked. And instead of keeping her that way, the film allows, allows for her to cover herself by putting on a t-shirt and underwear. And during the rape, uh, instead of taking her clothes off, Stan only lowers her underwear. This, together with shorter scenes, towards the fantasy of, of rape as long and drawn out. And this lowering of underwear is seen in a, multi, um, in a number of other films, such as Violation, American Mary, and MFA. In the latter, there is a full reversal of nudity expectation, as Luke keeps Noel's dress on, lowers her underwear, and completely unclothes himself. By framing Noel's face and keeping Luke out of the focus, the camera also cuts his face off. He becomes an unidentified body, an avatar for the other rapists, the Noel will eventually kill. The scene further subverts the idea that rape shrinks a woman's body to an object to be desired by turning Luke literally into an object. And now finally, this brings me to the second part of the talk, the construction of the Avenger and her revenge. So the revenge part of a rape revenge film is equally as important as the rape part. Several issues have been put forward regarding rape, especially when it comes to the character's transformation from victim to avenger. Casey Ryan Kelly writes that by simply avenging rape, the film does not advance female empowerment, but instead, a film's political investments are reflected by how violence is enacted and how spectators are invited to identify with the avenging heroine or hero. One of the ways uh, to analyze a film's political investment is to look at the Avenger. So if we turn to key revenge, rape revenge texts, such as The Virgin Spring, The Last House on the Left, and I Spit on a Grave, we can see two possibilities for the Avenger. The two former films depict the Avenger as someone uh, other than the victim, thus they portray vengeance by proxy. And in, um, in I Spit on a Grave, the film depicts the Avenger as the victim herself. So by portraying the Avenger by proxy, the films make use of the female victim and the act of rape as minor props in the narrative to motivate and justify a particularly violent version of masculinity. Henry agrees by writing that proxy revengeance is in keeping with broader American masculine revenge cinema, where the male hero fights and conquers the other for protection and honor of family and nation. And although, although there is another type of revenge by proxy, which is enacted by a female family member or friend, it still falls on some of the traps that we'll see about female victim avenger. Nevertheless, a positive view can be seen in female-directed films where revenge by proxy is shown through the creation of a sisterhood which acts as avengers, as in the latest club, for example. The other option is when the victim of the assault becomes the Avenger herself. Sarah Perjanski writes that these narratives can be understood as feminist narratives in, in which women face rape, they recognize the law will neither protect them nor avenge them, 
and they take take the law into their own hands. Naturally, Brzezinski's views when it comes to the female victim avenger are positive and feminist. Nevertheless, there is one inherent problem with this, which is that in rape revenge films, rape or the threat of rape can serve as a mere lever that pushes women into powerful and independent agent who can protect herself. Therefore, as much as rape is portrayed as painful, it is ultimately a positive event, one that enables the emergence of a woman's latent independent identity. And this is certainly not a unique view, as it has been argued that rape is the initiation right that pushes women from being soft victims to becoming hard avengers. Heller Nicholas uh, picks up on another important aspect of the Avenger when she writes that this character is turned into violent monsters while also being coded as vampish and over-sexualized. The sexualization transformation, sorry, the sexualized transformation can be seen in films such as Miss 45, where Tana becomes a serial killer who avenges not only her only true rape, but the figurative rape of all women. And in doing so, she changes her outfits to increasingly provocative clothes. Miss 45 illustrates the two problems that scholars have put forward when it comes to the revenge. First is that the film starts as avenging sexism and misogyny and then turns into active murder. And the second is that women out, uh, the women's outfits here adhere to the male gaze. Tana from Miss 45, similar to Jennifer in Ice Peter Grave, become the figure of the femme Cassatrice, who arouses the fear of castration and death while simultaneously playing with the masochist's desire for death. Conversely, the use of outfits is also updated in contemporary films directed by women. In Promising Young Woman, for example, Cass's preference for clothes is seen through her constant use of candy colors with light and pink tight blouses and skirts, but the aesthetic does not belong solely to Cassie, as the film itself employs such style. Therefore, it can be argued that during the climax, when Cassie dresses as a sexy nurse uh, to, re to enact revenge on the rapist, she's not changing who she is, as the colors and style have already been attached to the character. Moreover, the film pushes away the idea of the vagina dentata, as even dressed as a sexy nurse, her outfit and sexiness are not what draws the rapist to her. In fact, Cassie has to insist for him to come to the bedroom with her. Thus, Cassie's outfits in Promising a Woman, although sexy, did not work for the male gaze, but for Cassie herself. Another problem that arises is the transformation from victim to avenger, as it might weaken the, the character's motives for revenge. Jennifer's transformation in A Spit on a Grave, for example, is such that her subjectivity becomes further out of reach as she begins to resemble a mythical feminist avenger, and therefore loosening the tight cause and effect pattern of rape and revenge, making the protagonist's motivations questionable as she becomes a serial killer. Phil Hardy argues that the characters like Jennifer in A Spit on a Grave, Madeline in Thriller, A Cruel Picture, and even The Bride in Kill Bill Volume 1 enter a catatonic state as they become silent and obsessive, and thus the film separates the viewer from the character, pushing her dangerously close to the negative st female stereotype, the all-destructive femme castratrice. Contemporary female-directed rape revenge films do hinge on some of these tropes. In, an, in MFA, Noelle becomes more and more obsessed with avenging not only her rape, but also the rape of other women. After her rape, Noelle faces her rapist Luke and asks him to confess. And when she accidentally kills him, the camera frames her from below and the light from the ceiling becomes a halo above her head, turning her into an angel and instantly forgiving her. Not only that, but Luke's position is framed upside down. Thus, instead of canonizing him, the film turns him into an antichrist figure. By the same token, Cassie in Promising a Woman becomes her own enemy as she sacrifices her life to avenge her friend's rape and suicide. Cassie is literally portrayed as an avenging angel. Similar to the light turned halo above Noel's head in MFA, Cassie is constantly framed in such a way. 
Further, the furniture in her house creates the illusion of giving her wings. And finally, both in the first time and the last time that we see her, um, Cassie appears, uh, the first one uh, when she's at a bar, when she pretends to be drunk, and the last one when she's killed by all and she's lying in bed, Cassie's framed with her arms horizontally extended and her legs intertw intertwined in a Christ-like position. So the subversive use of religious iconography is important to mention given its presence in rape revenge narratives. From the Virgin Springs depiction of faith to the countless scenes where the victim avenger prays and asks for forgiveness prior to commencing her rape, to the Catholic Church being the savior of Katie in I Speak to a Grave 2, and to the church being the place where Amy faces her trauma in Straw Dogs, religious iconography and symbolism are used to either excuse the vengeance through having the avenger begging for forgiveness or is seen as the all-time savior. In Promising Young Woman, American Mary and MFA, the victim avengers are giving permission and forgiveness without begging for it. And now, now let's turn to the moment that the revenge is enacted. So as mentioned briefly before, some of these victim avengers become the all-destructive femme cassatrice. The construction of the female character into a femme cassatrice has been theorized in depth, mainly by Barbara Creed, who writes that the myth about women as castrator clearly points to male fears and fantasies about the female genitals as a trap, a black hole which threatens, threatens to swallow them up and eat them into pieces. She then goes on to name this woman as castrator as femme cassatrice by, and placing her in the middle of rape revenge films by writing that the femme cassatrice seeks revenge, um, seeks revenge on the men who have raped her. When Creed writes about the female genital, genitals as a trap, she's referring to the myth of the vagina dentata, the toothed vagina. And to quote Dawn's research in the film Teeth, the toothed vagina has its basis in ancient masculine fears of the unknown of sexual congress. The mystery of sexual union evoke fears of castration, the loss of the penis during, during intercourse. Undoubtedly, it relates to fears or weaknesses and impotence, destruction suffered during union. So according to the myth, the male hero must tame this monstrous woman and break her teeth in order to render her safe. Rape revenge narratives literalize the fear of castration through its depiction of the victim avenger who takes revenge on her rapists by castrating them. Indeed, as Kelly points out, seduction followed by castration evokes the myth of, uh, mythic subtext of the vagina dentata, and this is clearly seen in the film Miss 45, as after each kill, Tana becomes more and more feminine, wearing bright lipstick, sorry, bright red lipstick and suggestive outfits. And she kills her boss by seducing him, letting him kiss her, and when he lifts her nun dress, they're, they're, they're a costume party by the way, he sees a gun in a phallic scene of him facing a stiff gun while on his knees. However, there are two notable examples of male-directed rape revenge films that play with this assumption and offer something different, hard candy and teeth. So while the latter literalizes the fear of the vagina dentata, the former rewrites the Little Red Riding Hood fairy tale, which, to quote Creed, suggests symbolically the vagina dentata with its reference to the Red Riding Hood, which is the clitoris, um, and places emphasis on the devouring jaws of the wolf grandmother. So in Hard Candy, what Haley does offers a new positive use of the myth. So although Haley and Jeff engage in flirtatious and overly sexual charged chat online, she's 14 and he's 32. Moreover, what Haley does to Jeff is beyond shock and gore that is usually employed in rape revenge films. Haley straps Jeff to a table and shows him a video of her medically, medically castrating him. The twist, though, is that Haley does not actually perform surgery on Jeff. She's only showing him a video of someone else's surgery. Unbeknownst to Jeff, then, Haley threatens him with the fear of castration rather than castration itself. Teeth literalizes the myth of the vagina dentata. 
Dawn is a teenager who practices celibacy by being the leader of a group called The Promise. And one day she's raped by her love interest, Toby, who's also a member of the celibacy group. However, during the rape, Dawn's body reacts and castrates Toby. At the first glance, teeth seems to be a feminist interpretation of the vagina dentata, constructing the toothed vagina as a natural defense mechanism that gives women the ability to survive rape culture, as Dawn utilizes her gift to punish men who have assaulted her. Nevertheless, as much as these texts try to subvert the myth of the vagina dentata and the trope of the castration and rape revenge films, Claire Henry notes that the filmmakers' attempts to modernize and make female empowerment movies out of the vagina dentata myth, or the Little Red Riding Hood, um, results in contradictory and murky post-feminist texts. So if we look at teeth, although Dawn punishes the men who have assaulted or harassed her, in order to employ said punishment, she first must endure rape or some kind of penetration. Moreover, as much as Dawn finds power within herself, towards the end of the film, the castration scenes downplay the horror of the rape to focus on the horror, horror of castration, turning the latter into the horror, uh, into the real horror of the film, especially as the camera lingers on the amputated penises or fingers or on the gaping wounds left on the boys' bodies. Further, especially as what haunts Dawn and what causes her nightmares are not the trauma of her rape, but the castration itself. Henry argues that the representation shies away from showing the impact of rape or allowing it to be a motivation for Dawn's revenge. Her bite is reflexive, accidental, and so lacks the agency of revenge. And she, she later furthers this by arguing that by depriving her of agency, and of a feminist awareness that her, her, her sorry feminist awareness that her horrific experiences count as rape, the connection between rape and revenge in the film is weakened. Both her motivation and her vengeance are downplayed, and hence the strong narrative pattern of rape and revenge is diluted. The revenge part of female directed rape revenge films is not is different. First all, um, there are only two films that rely on castration as the chosen form of revenge. But the act itself is quite different. So there is no cutting of penises, there are no close-ups on, on amputated members or gaping wounds. So what the ladies' club and traps show is the aftermath of castration, and the former also shows the castration as being surgically done. In many of these films, what is seen as survival revenge. In Black Rock, three friends, Abby, Lou, and Sarah, must find a way to protect themselves as Abby experiences the threat of rape and death. In these films, the female characters barely have time to compute what is happening to them and their survival instincts, instincts kick in. Rarely are, the, are these characters allowed time to come to terms with uh, the re reality or explore their post-rape trauma. However, there is a group of films that do focus on post-rape trauma and give time to the characters to slowly transform from victim to avenger and plan out their revenge. For example, Black Christmas, which invites the audience to align themselves with Riley through her flashbacks. Um, so, sorry, Riley through her flashbacks as the diegetic time is set years after the rape. Brodzinski writes that one of the ways that rape revenge narratives give credibility to their characters and emphasize their trauma is by the use of flashbacks and point of view. She furthers this by writing that giving validity to a woman's perspective on rape means accepting a feminist insistence on the credibility of women who report rape. Another example is the film Violation. The film is not told in a chronological order, Therefore, we can only understand that what we are seeing is Miriam's flashbacks when we see the revenge. Miriam's flashbacks help to ground her, subjectivating truth against Dylan's claims that the rape was in fact consensual. The order of the scenes in violation also works to highlight her trauma by showing jumbled single actions, upside-down sequences that work to convey Miriam's confused and disoriented subjectivity. 
Another important aspect to explore in violation is exactly the moment that revenge is enacted. Miriam asks Dylan to meet up, letting him assume that they are meeting for a sexual encounter. One might argue that Miriam lures Dylan by evoking the myth of the vagina dentata, but what is interesting in Miriam's, Miriam and Dylan's encounter is that despite him believing that they're about to have sex, Miriam's demeanor is cold. She does not correspond to his kisses and she remains curt. Further, the feminization of the victim avenger is not seen in Miriam, and the one who becomes completely nude is Dylan. In this scene, there is a full reversal in power. Cinematic history has placed nudity with the woman and power with the man. However, what we have here is Dylan's complete vulnerability as he's naked, blindfolded, and completely unaware of Miriam's motives. Miriam, on the other hand, remains closed. She has the upper hand and a willing victim. Miriam knocks him out and begins her revenge. So after a physical struggle, Miriam kills Dylan. She hangs him from the ceiling and bleeds him dry, thus evoking the treatment of cattle and evoking him to um, equating Dylan to an animal. She saws his limbs, boils his members, removes the meat and fat from the bones, flushes some parts down the toilet and breaks his bones, turning them into ashes. During the scenes, Miriam struggles, she vomits and she cries, but she remains focused on her task. Miriam has not gone crazy, she's extremely aware of what she's doing, and this makes it more difficult for her. Violation, therefore, does not glorify revenge, rather it shows, in brutal honesty, what can happen to the mind once it experiences such trauma. The last part of her revenge is to take Dylan's ashes, mix it with ice cream, and give it to everyone at her sister's party, including her sister, to eat. Miriam subverts the idea that rape turns women into objects for men to consume by literally turning Dylan into food and offering it for people to eat. Similar to this is Mary's revenge in American Mary. Mary takes her revenge on Dr. Grant, her professor, who raped her by turning him into an object for her to practice surgeries on, and in doing so she amputates his arms, making it impossible for him to work as a surgeon again, she amputates his legs, restricting his ability to move freely. She sews shut his eyes and mouth, making it impossible for him to exert his gaze upon women and making him silent, subverting the trope of muteness employed in many rape revenge films. One of the things that motivates Miriam is the fact that Dylan does not take accountability for the rape. He tells a version of the story which interprets her don't stop as don't stop. Similarly, this is what motivates Noel's revenge in MFA and Cassie's in Promising Young Woman. Cassie does not want to kill men, she wants people to face what they've done and acknowledge their actions within a broader context of systematic rape culture. In MFA, Noel only wants Luke to acknowledge and apologize for the rape, but when he denies and answers aggressively, she pushes him and he falls from the second floor, dying instantly. After this, Noelle joins a support group for rape victims, but when she's faced with the reality of rape, which allows rapists to walk free and burdens the women with the responsibility to protect themselves, Noelle decides to take matters into her hands. She learns about another rape victim, she finds her rapists, and she kills them one by one. When enacting revenge here, um, in MFA, she does not want accountability anymore, she wants bloody revenge. Her modus operandi becomes more and more violent until she realizes that her actions have been hurtful to other women and she lets herself be caught by the police. Noelle is arrested during her graduation ceremony, similar to the wedding ceremony in Promising Young Woman, that is interrupted by the sound of sirens. Noelle walks towards uh, the police. They hold their gun at her. Uh, she turns around and then puts her hand behind her back. She wears a black robe, similar to a priestess, then alluding to her previous canonization through the placement of a halo above her head. She's placed in the middle of the frame, the police circle her and approach her with caution, highlighting her power. As the police handcuff her, the camera lingers on her face, inviting her subjectivity to be the focus of the scene, the vibrant soundtrack, Noelle's complacent movement, 
and challenging gaze further her martyrization. So in conclusion, this talk explores some of the differences between male-directed and female-directed rape revenge films. The first main argument raised is that contemporary films are engaging with the paradox of showing and not showing rape, and they're ultimately showing the assault in different ways in order to emphasize trauma, but they're careful not to linger on gratuitous displays of eroticized violence. The second argument is that the films are turning from the two-act narrative that portrays revenge played out instantly after the rape, and they're adopting diverse narrative structures. By doing so, these films are able to explore their characters' post-rape traumas, delve into their subjectivity through flashbacks or through their lives in the aftermath of sexual assaults. So here are some of the references that I've used. Um, I don't have a list for all of the films that I've discussed, but feel free to send me an email um, and I'll send you a list of the films if you want. But yeah, thank you very much.